Sorry, you're good, Luke, go ahead. All right, let's begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about the history of where we are, Medicaid and Medicaid funding in New York State. And that's me there. Um, so I first of all, I wanna say that I have been a proud member of the elder law section of the state bar since uh, when it was formed. And it's been a great experience being part of the bar and the elder law section. And it's given opportunities to do some creative things. And we're gonna talk about one of those creative things today that we did collectively back in the early 2000s, and that is the compact for long-term care. So the way that I got an education in long-term care financing in New York, I was fortunate to be part of the governor's task force on long-term care reform, which was convened in 1996. So that goes back 24 years now. And the task force had a number of people, the commissioner of the Department of Health chaired it, people from across the state from various different uh, disciplines and backgrounds. There were two elder law attorneys on an 11 member panel, if you can imagine such a thing, uh, myself and Elise Spatula. And the governor's task force looked at all of the issues surrounding long-term care 24 years ago, the demographics, the financing, made a number of recommendations, none of which were adopted. One of the recommendations that the governor's task force made was for something called a defined contribution plan. And in the context of long-term care financing, we're gonna see that there are really only three pools of money, individuals own money, private insurance policies, and then public fund financing through Medicaid. And when we look at it, and we look at where we are today in terms of that financing, we have a $6 billion New York State budget deficit, but federally, we are running a one plus trillion dollar annual deficit, and the debt is now exceeding $22 trillion. Those numbers are very important. We're gonna talk about them a little bit, but keep in mind that we're working in an area that was perfectly predictable 24 years ago, but government inaction and misaction has put us in a position where Medicare basically is stripped out from long-term care financing. That was not true in 1996. A lot of that happened in the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. And since then, we've had issues like the Jim O.V. Sebelius case, where as most of you know, the rehabilitative services that Medicare provides are being misinterpreted so that people are getting turned down for Medicare skilled care coverage incorrectly. They have challenged that, they won in court, they had to go back to try to enforce the original judgment. And it's a never ending process. And I'm, I'm afraid it's not going to get better. It's gonna get worse because the funding for the number of people, the baby boomers coming through the pipeline that need long-term care is just insufficient through the current financing structures. So when we look at long-term care, it has really shifted into that Medicaid silo. And so we need to address the Medicaid issues and the $4 billion Medicaid shortfall that is in the current budget and 6.1 billion, 4 billion is Medicaid. So for those that don't recall, I'm sure all of you are painfully familiar with the managed long-term care system. And MLTC, came in through the first Medicaid redesign team. And that was led by a gentleman that was brought in, Jason Helgerson, to reform New York's Medicaid program. And we have the MLTC system that today, um, if you read the report, mismanaged long-term care, is responsible for denials and, and just a misapplication of funds in the long-term care system. So what does the governor do to fix the current problem? Points MRT2. So we have a Medicaid redesign team. We have the list of people. If you want to take a look at it, I'll be happy to forward it around that are on MRT2. But these folks are charged with coming up with $2.5 billion of Medicaid cuts in the next 30 days. Good luck. So what can we do as an elder law section? What is our role? And just a bit on demography, most of you know the, the national statistics, but in New York, it's more acute than nationally because we have an outmigration of young, talented, tax-paying people, and we have a retention of seniors who need healthcare. And if you 
practice in Florida and New York, you know that there's actually a reverse migration of seniors at the point in time when they need long-term care. Part of that is because of New York's generosity in its Medicaid program, in particular in the home care area. So these are some statistics. I'm not gonna bore you with all of them, but we have a general population, population shift in New York away from the young working taxpayer and towards the consumer of long-term care services, many of whom come back to use the Medicaid program. So these are all statistics that were borne out when we were doing the compact research for that 30 year period, 2000 to 2030, we're two thirds of the way through now, New York was projected to, to be spending $1 trillion on Medicaid related services just for seniors. 8% of New York's gross state product and the healthcare payroll, much of it determined by public expenditure, is 14% of the state economy, and that is growing. So will the federal government bail us out? Several years ago, we got a chunk of money, $8 billion from the federal government called DISRIP, and DISRIP money was put through affordable care organizations, ACOs, which were hospital-based. That $8 billion just ran out last month. It's the end of the line for the DISRIP funds. So a lot of the programs that were DISRIP funded and a lot of the people whose salaries are DISRIP funded have had to find other things to do. And we don't expect a federal bailout. In fact, what the federal government has done in a limited part of Medicaid and is trying to do for the rest of Medicaid is block grant. And the projections are that New York would take a severe hit if the federal government block grants Medicaid because of the way our reimbursement structure is structured. So it's not gonna be a pretty picture. We're not gonna get bailed out by the feds. So what does New York do? Where will New York go in terms of the policies on long-term care financing? And what is our section's role? What as elder law attorneys can we do in, in this vast system where we don't really have a seat at the table? We represent individual clients. Um, and the experience that we had back when we tried to do the compact for long-term care was we had lobbyists. We had NALA, New York NALA hire a lobbyist. We had our lobbyist. And what the lobbyist came back and said was, oh, each of you just kick in $5,000 and I'll go up and I'll get your bill passed. That's quote. So the political system is not favorable to public policy advocacy from a group like the New York State Bar Elder Law Section. We don't come with big clients and big dollars that can lobby and, and impact legislation that way. So in 2005, our section, after a lengthy study, issued a report, and you'll see the report there. If anyone would like a copy, I have it. Chapters were authored by a number of section members on a variety of topics dealing with long-term care reform in New York State and it was a committee, the Long-Term Care Reform Committee that our section had formed at the time. We issued that report, we published it. We invited two of the legislative council for the Senate and Assembly Aging Committee, Bob Hurst and Greg Olson, to our annual meeting in New York City. And at that point, we issued the report and talked about it. And we had a very, very healthy discussion with these two legislators' representatives, uh, Senator Martin Golden and Assemblyman Stephen Engelbright. We had a great conference. We thought we had a great discussion. Little did we know that Bob Hers and Senator, Senator Golden's uh, counsel went back from that conference and drafted a bill and put the bill into the legislature called the Compact for Long-Term Care. And when we found out, we were related because it was an idea that spawned right out of the elder law section's uh, report. And at the time that report was done, the Partnership for Long-Term Care was still a very vibrant program in New York. Long-term care insurance was still seen as a very vital and viable financing source for long-term care. And so I've invited to the call today the person who drafted our chapter, not only on long-term care insurance, but when I went to Gail Holobinka, who at the time, uh, Gail, in 2005, I believe you were working in, in the private insurance industry? Yes, I was. But Gail had been with the Department of Health and had launched the partnership and run the partnership for long-term care for several years. And then went, when politics changed, went to, she was Cuomo one in that administration. 
And when that changed, she went to the private industry and began to write policies for long-term care insurance companies. So I thought she was uniquely qualified to write the chapter for our study, and she did, but she wanted to write another chapter. And Gail, this is where I think you can pick us up from where the New York State Partnership, which was successful for many years, started to decline, and you saw the need for the next generation of partnership. Uh, well, it, it quickly became obvious that while long-term care insurance was an important facet of how to finance long-term care itself, that it just simply was not going to work for everybody. For one thing, what we have is a product that because of the risk at the other end is more expensive than most people could afford. And the other thing is that you still have people who are in denial and who put it off to the point where either that affordability has truly grown beyond their ability to pay or they cannot get it. So I started thinking, and this was why, while I was still within the partnership, how am I going to deal with the next step, which is to encompass more of the middle class rather than those who had more wealth to be able to purchase insurance. Thank you, Gail, and I'll bring you back in a moment. But the legislation was drafted. It did pass the Senate twice. It did not get through the assembly for a variety of reasons, none of which I will talk about today. <laughs> and it did make it through Governor Patterson's budget. If you remember, he had a cup of coffee at the state capitol and was governor for about a year. And in his budget, he created a pilot for the partnership. And we were excited that the partnership was now New York state law. And we met with Mark Kissinger, who at the time was Governor Patterson's counsel. And Mark said, yeah, this is great, but we didn't fund it. So there's no money for the pilot. But if you go out and you get some private foundation to fund it, we'll run it for you. So, so good legislation is made. We went to the Kaiser Foundation, we went to Robert Wood Johnson, we went to a number of places, knocked on their doors, and we couldn't get a sponsor for the pilot to fund the partnership. And so that law is still on the books as a pilot program. That's from 2010. Here we are 10 years later. So where are we in terms of long-term care financing? Where are our clients in terms of the Medicaid program that they have come to rely on, that they've been encouraged to rely on? And this is a quote that I read faithfully whenever I can, and I'm gonna read it right now. No agency of the government has any right to complain about the fact that middle-class people confronted with desperate circumstances choose voluntarily to inflict poverty upon themselves when it is the government itself which has established the rule that poverty is a prerequisite to the receipt of government assistance in the defraying of the costs of ruinously expensive but absolutely essential medical treatment. I've quoted that in many, many cases that I've argued on the Medicaid side. That was Justice Bellicosa, Bellicosa in the New York State Court of Appeals. We gave him an award for basically writing the Shaw decision, which was a phenomenal decision for our clients. And that's a quote, if you don't use it, you should. Keep it handy. Something that I think for us as elder law attorneys really puts a crystallizing voice to the, to the situations that our clients face where they're facing either the road to impoverishment by spending all their assets down or the road to divestiture by creating a Medicaid asset protection trust or other transfers where they can then qualify for Medicaid. And when Gail used to speak for the partnership, which she did on a regular basis all across New York and the country, she had a slide, a PowerPoint slide with a road with two arrows one arrow for divestiture and one arrow for impoverishment. And she would say, where would a rational person walk down? What path would they choose? And rational behavior says, you're gonna to choose to try to preserve your assets, preserve your income and do the planning that would allow you to pr protect those assets. So the divestiture path is one that was perceived by many to be less than honest, less than, than truthful, that you're trying to hide assets. As attorneys, we know that we're simply following the law 
and getting to the program, the only program that can provide our clients with assistance. But if you remember back, this was seen as such a, a divisive issue. Divestiture and transferring assets was criminalized by the federal government. And we had a statute first that made it a crime to transfer assets for Medicaid purposes. And then that was repealed and replaced with a, a statute that made it a crime to advise another on how to transfer assets. And that was granny goes to jail, which was immediately repealed when replaced with granny's lawyer goes to jail. And so during this time, the elder law section became more proactive. And we developed a, an affirmative legislative program where we would go up the hill with something in hand that was a viable alternative. And I believe it bought us a seat at the table and gained us credibility in our lobbying efforts. And we were seen for a long time as just people that opposed every Medicaid cut possible. But now we were coming with a viable alternative. And so our opposition to the Medicaid cuts became more recognized as being legitimate within the context of what we do as lawyers. So that's a bit of the history. When we look at our clients and, and we educate our clients, there are three fundamental choices as they age in terms of getting long-term care. Where would you want to live? If you're gonna get long-term care, what are your housing options? Most of our clients want to age in place in their own homes. Some choose senior living environments. Nobody wants to go to a nursing home. So choosing the place where you receive care is one. Choosing the people that will provide that care is two. Do you have family that can fill that role? If you need formal caregivers, are they available in the setting that you've chosen in the first question? And then how do you pay for it? And paying for long-term care, as I said earlier, really comes down to only three sources of money. The client's own income and assets, private insurance, whether it be long-term care or a life insurance product. Now we have hybrids and different life products with riders or Medicaid. Medicare is not a player in this game, so we have to get Medicare out of our clients' minds when they think of long-term care. But I will tell you that AARP does surveys on a very regular basis and they poll seniors. And the question asked is, if you need long-term care, how will you pay for it? And the percentages of seniors who say Medicare goes from 60 to 90%, depending on the survey. So most seniors are still diluted. They're still thinking that Medicare is gonna play in this game, but it won't. So this is Gail's slide on long-term care financing, what's the right answer? Is it a public funded long-term care program? Can we have Medicare for all with a part E or D or F or whatever it turns out to be that is a long-term care payment? Medicare Advantage plans are now creeping into this, but not in a real significant way. And the answer is there's not enough money in Medicare and they're planning to cut it so to think that we're going to get a new rich benefit for long-term care through the federal <clears throat> Medicare program, it's not going to happen. And we said this 20 years ago, and it hasn't happened. In fact, Medicare has gone the other way with cases like the Jimmo case. So the compact for long-term care was developed. It was a seed planted in the elder law sections task force report, committee report on long-term care reform. And the, the basis of the compact, is to rationalize financing for long-term care by taking two of the sources, private financing through the individual's own income and assets, or an insurance policy that could supplement those income and assets, and developing a program where that poverty, the impoverishment, was not a prerequisite. As Judge Bellicosa said, people are put into that position where they face a Hobson's choice. I either give away all my assets, or I spend all my assets on the cost of care which in New York is now up $150,000 to $200,000 per year. So middle-class families will be wiped out in one, two, or three years. If they're going into private pay, then they're going to be impoverished down to that $15,750 level. So when we look at the choices, the compact now creates a program where private financing becomes the upfront financing. So the first dollars in are either dollars out of our client's pocket or out of an insurance policy that they can buy to satisfy their pledge, to satisfy their requirement for financing their own care on the front end. On the back end is a subsidy, which is the public financing piece. 
and that's Medicaid dollars right now because we don't have anything else. But if Medicare ever wanted to spend dollars on long-term care through Medicare Advantage, this would be the place that that would also fit. And those dollars come in once the pledge is met and the individual has satisfied the upfront requirement and the public piece is not Medicaid, so it isn't an impoverishment because the individual still has assets and income left. It's a subsidy targeted specifically for long-term care expenses. And Gail, maybe you could talk a little bit about the difference between the compact subsidy and Medicaid. Well, the difference be between the two of them is that if you look at the, one of the things I always say that their buck for the need for long-term care, so many fewer people would ever be on, on, on Medicaid. And I also believe that most people are honest and they want to be honest, except that we give them no choice, as you said. We give them a choice of poverty. So the way that it, this one works is that insurance is meant to pay for a loss. And in terms of long-term care, what is that loss? The loss is virtually everything you own. So if you have, to the Medicaid point of view, it really doesn't make any difference where that money comes from as long as it comes. And so if you have insurance, an individual who has $100,000 and Medicaid says that you should pay $100,000, then to the Medicaid point of view, they don't care where that money came from. So what we're doing is that we are going to take insurance and structure it according to what the individual has to lose. And then Medicaid will get that money and therefore they are sort of held harmless for the amount of money that would have been paid in. Does that meet what you wanted to hear? <laughs> yes. So the last line on this slide is responsibility without limit is irresponsible. And th this is the position, as the Shaw case said, that our clients are put in. They face either impoverishment <clears throat> or divestiture. And it is not a natural act to divest yourself of all of your assets. It's not what people line up to do. They do it because they have to, because there's no other choice. And so the compact is designed to give a choice to middle-class individuals. So people who have no assets would still rely on the traditional Medicaid program. People who have sufficient income and assets to self-insure which are far fewer people today than when we were doing the compact back in 2005. Mm. Uh, the cost of care has just gone through the roof. And so now far fewer people can self-insure. So we have a wider bandwidth, Gail, I think, of middle-class de defined individuals who do not have the income and assets to self-insure. So it's for the people in between existing Medicaid clients who have no resources and those people who have resources that can self-insure that this problem lies. And the compact is designed for those middle-class individuals in New York State to allow them another option. So there are three phases to the compact and we're gonna take probably about 10 or 15 minutes to kind of break down the compact and then we'll open it up for questions. So the compact has three phases, pre-compact, and that's the planning phase. And as Gail said, this is the point in time where you would buy insurance, you would arrange your affairs and your assets so that you had a payment source to meet your pledge. The second is the participant phase. And this is when someone who is at that point chronically ill. And so they're gonna meet the definitions of chronic illness and we, we don't invent anything here. We borrow those definitions from existing law. But once they're determined to be chronically ill, they will enter the compact with a plan of care through their own provider. And Gail, this is piggybacking off of some of the existing long-term care insurance apparatus. So as someone from the long-term care insurance industry, just tell our, tell our group a little bit about how those claims get processed and what the insurance processing is now and how the compact just piggybacks off that. 
Uh, the way it's processed now is that a claim comes into the insurer and the insurer usually has will have someone who will define whether or not the person meets the HIPAA definition of the need for long-term care. The insurer then will say yes or no that the individual requires long-term care and uh, then a care plan is created and uh, the claims come in and they're paid. The difference with the compact is that that same thing goes on but the insurance the individual has is not geared to the cost of the care or the length of the care. It's geared to its limits have to do with the pledge. The insurance itself is limited to the pledge. And the pledge amount we'll talk about in a moment was designed back when the law for Medicaid was a bit different, it's pre-2006 when we were doing the initial work on this. So we, mm -hmm. we did not yet have the Deficit Reduction Act changes and the expansion of the look back to five years. So we'll give you what was in the bill that passed in 2010. And the third phase is the beneficiary phase. So in the participant phase, the individual is private paying for care, whether it's their own income and assets or insurance dollars, they're private paying for care in accordance with a plan of care that they've developed and that has been approved. And they're receiving services in a setting that they choose and paying for those expenses using the funds until ultimately they have met their dollar limit and their pledge is complete. Then they become beneficiaries and those long-term care expenses, only those long-term care expenses, they're not on Medicaid, but they're receiving a subsidy for the long-term care expenses that they have been private financing through their plan of care. So those are the three phases. Let's break it down into a little bit more detail. So the pledge is to pay the lesser of 50% of countable assets or a maximum of three years of care based upon the average regional rate in your area. So you'll see the calculation there, New York City, the average regional rate is now 12,844. Multiply that by 36 months. So the maximum pledge that an individual would have in New York City would be $462,384, regardless of their level of assets. That would be the maximum pledge. If the individual had $200,000 of assets, their pledge would be $100,000 and they would be allowed to keep the other $100,000. In terms of income, once they go on the subsidy, once they're a beneficiary of the plan, then 25% of their annual income would go toward the cost of care. 75% of their annual income, they would be able to keep to pay for their other living expenses. And there are some provisions for hardship exceptions within that and they'd be responsible to pay 10% of long-term care services. So, Gail, this is your chart. Do you wanna just walk through the steps from the initial contact through to having met the pledge? Okay, uh, in step one, obviously, they would then go to a, uh, an assessor uh, they get an assessment, do they meet the HIPAA definition? If they are eligible, then they go to step two. Once they go to step two, you establish the pledge. The pledge equals 50% of whatever it is that they wish to protect with insurance and or the three years, whichever that is. The pledge account is then kept so as they use services, it will be paid for out of the pledge account. Once they have completed their pledge, let's say that the person had $200,000 and they had a $100,000 pledge, that pledge will be paid either by their insurance or out of their pocket, whichever they wish. Uh, it, they then go to step three. And under step three, 
th there is a Medicaid subsidy, meaning that Medicaid will pay for the long-term care services. However, the individual must pay an amount to the provider of such services of 10% greater than the cost of the services to Medicaid. And it, it has to be obviously a qualified long-term care service under, under Medicaid. But I think the most important thing about step three is that the individual is responsible for all other non-long-term care medical coverage. The concept backing this is, is there but for the need for long-term care, people were taking care of themselves. And since we are allowing them 75% of their income, plus they get to keep their assets if they have purchased long, this long-term care coverage, um, that they should be able to handle this back end and working uh, in conjunction with Medicaid, but not under Medicaid, under the poverty situation. So, Gail, they would have still their Medicare coverage, Medicare supplement insurance, any other they, private health insurance that they have to meet their needs right. for true medical coverage. Right. Unlike they, a system where they could drop coverage and Medicaid would pay for everything. Right. Medic they are exactly the same as they were before they entered the program. They are private individuals. The only thing they're coming together with Medicaid on is this is the long term care portion. That's it. And okay, what's what's the number one reason that people don't buy long term care insurance? Cost. Can't afford it. <laughs> so incredibly expensive. policies you can't buy in New York State today. There are one or two on the market left, but they're priced at the point where you can't get the coverage. So the, the number of partnership policies, I heard it is it was in single digits last year, um, less than 10, sold yeah. in the entire state of New York. So other insurance products have crept into the market, life insurance with riders. Any of those are viable to meet the, the pledge under the compact. And we have had a turnabout since 2005 because when we were introducing this in the Senate and the Assembly, we had public hearings across New York State. And I remember in New York City, we had 46 people testify, 43 testified in favor of the compact, and three testified against, and they were all from the insurance industry. And one of those was Genworth. And Genworth, I have their six-page letter that they circulated throughout the Capitol when we were promoting the compact. And Genworth was an opponent because they believed that having the compact would inhibit their ability to sell very large long-term care policies. Well, Gail, what happened to that? Well, there's large and then there's impossible. Uh, one of the things that occurred is that as the actuarial uh, assumptions were found to be incorrect, the cost of the policies and the coverage thereafter uh, soared, which is when you're looking at a, a long-term care event at the end, the cost of that has soared, the liability of it has soared. So it is no longer feasible to have a policy that will meet the need for the cost of long-term care, which is why the compact is unique. It's not meeting the needs of long-term care. It is protecting what each individual has to lose. So ironically, on the last call that we had with AARP, we had the Genworth representatives and I had the CEO of Genworth at a conference that we, we did last uh, June. And Genworth is now designing products for $200,000 to $250,000 lifetime benefit, which are products that are much less expensive oh, than existing yeah. long-term care insurance and would be available to far more people to allow them to meet the pledge. So our primary opponent for the compact back in 2005 is now an advocate for the compact because they know that without the context of a program that defines liability, that manages the risk and capitates the risk at a certain dollar value, 
where people don't have to buy unlimited coverage, they can buy a, a policy that fits that risk, that is an affordable product for the middle class so that people can insure these risks safely and affordably and be able to keep literally all of their assets. And we even talked, Gail, about some tail coverages that would pay that extra 10% of income. So there are a lot of creative designs under the compact that could work out. Uh, Gail and I wrote a piece on the role of insurance under the compact for long-term care, uh, and that's still out there. It's a little outdated but talking about how, in, how people can then insure the risk and more people can afford that. If you can't get insurance, then you can private pay into the compact, meet your pledge, and then have the subsidy to pay your long-term care costs. And again, this is like the dollars follow the patient. The subsidy would be payable to you whether you're in assisted living, whether you're at home, or whether you're in a nursing home. So it follows you in any setting that you choose and, and where you want to be. So the next slide, Gail, is the subsidy phase. And just briefly walk us through this. Okay, um, in the subsidy phase, the individual is asked to pledge 25, well, pledge. They must contribute 25% of their income and they pay 10% above whatever Medicaid has paid to a provider for a long-term care service. This gives us two advantages. Uh, one, it still allows the, the client to contribute to the cost of their care. But secondly, it also gives a boost to the provider community, which is hurting today under the, the payments that we could pay for under Medicaid. So it, it advantages two different groups. And the other thing about it is that the individual, because they have this backbone of their savings and their income, more of them can choose to remain at home. They don't have to go into facilities or anything like that. They are on, if the cost of long-term care was this minimal to begin with, we wouldn't have an issue. And so we went out and we hired an actuary and Gail's insurance company, MedAmerica at the time, actually paid the bill, which is a large bill, to have the compact actuarially scored by a company called Milliman. And for those that don't know, Milliman is the company that does most work in the long-term care arena for long-term care insurance companies and others in government. Uh, and Gail, you had a relationship with Milliman and you've used them in the past. Mm -hmm. And they scored the compact to show what it would result in terms of savings to New York State. And, and the results were pretty startling. Yes, they were. I mean, we were talking about, and, and these were based on assumptions. I worked with them and they were extremely conservative assumptions, I, I might add. Um, that we were looking at at least uh, 500 million in the first year, just because you people are no longer divesting. There's no reason to divest. And there also is still a, a, a contribution. So it, uh, it, it, it works out as people become more and more accustomed to not trying to afford poverty, trying to avoid poverty, the more savings are possible. So that's the out-of-pocket cost from people going off of Medicaid, going on to the compact, and private paying. We believe also that the insurance market, which has tanked for long-term care insurance, it's very, very depressed at this point in time for a variety of reasons, could resurface. And the Genworth CEO has confirmed that they are looking to re-enter the market with products that are affordable, but without context, those products are not meaningful. So the compact puts them in a position where they can sell products that can meet the demand of the marketplace and have an affordable market that they can tap in the middle class. And strengthening community services, I don't think at this stage can be emphasized enough. If you read here in Albany, all the articles being written, what the MRT2 is going to be looking at, most of the cuts are going to come on the community services side. 
So they're looking at cutting things like the consumer directed assistance program, other home care programs. And as you know, providers today work on very thin margins and it's very difficult to find aids with a pay scale that is so depressed. So having additional funds flowing into the home care market would allow providers more options and, and an ability to build workforce that under the Medicaid program just is never going to happen. So what are countable assets, you may ask? And that's a good question. The same as under the Medicaid rules uh, with some certain exceptions. And we put a provision in at Bob Herz's request that the, there was an advisory committee that the elder law section would have been part of and the commissioner of the Department of Health would be working on defining assets. So we put a three-year look back in at the time. Again, this was pre-DRA. And the three-year look back uh, was with regard to assets and excluded were the homestead and the other assets that you see listed there from countable assets. So this is an area that would have to be further defined based upon current law, but the asset list would piggyback off of what Medicaid currently exempts. Countable income would be the same as Medicaid, except there would be certain deductions that would be allowed. And again, a hardship provision. So people during the compact phase, during the pledge phase rather, are responsible for their own care. Once they're on subsidy, they keep 75% of their income, 25% goes toward the cost of care. And so the principles of the compact are shared responsibility. Individuals having an opportunity to pay for some of their own services and receive a subsidy to keep paying those services in the setting they choose once they have met their pledge. Um, ownership, people will be paying their own bills. And if you think the dollars will be differently spent when people are paying their own bills versus having an MLTC pay the bills, you're right. They will be shopping much more consciously for appropriate care and looking at the providers that they want to have providing them with care, allows people to stay in the setting they want, allows them a choice and greater independence. All things that we want for our clients. And Gail, yeah. it's anything you want to sum up with? Well, I think one of the things that uh, that I didn't sufficiently emphasize is that during the subsidy portion, the individual is paying for all their other long-term care, other than long-term care services, all of their co-pays and deductibles and all that sort of thing. And all of their normal medical needs are paid for by them, which it would have been had they not needed long-term care. That is important because I don't know what the number is now, but when I did the, the work up on this, I found that approximately 20% of the cost of the long-term care policy, long-term care uh, services to Medicaid clients were, was in non-long-term care services. So if that individual has the money to pay for those services, when they need long-term care, because that's now out of the way, the long-term care is on the side, that is another savings to Medicaid. And that had a huge impact, I have. And again, people who can't afford those things, who rely on Medicaid for basic health care coverage, will still have Medicaid. This is not to replace Medicaid. Right. This is only for people who would be in the compact and therefore have the 75% of their income and up to 100% of their assets available to them. Right. So taking the existing Medicaid population, people who are currently impoverished, who will qualify for Medicaid and don't have those resources, that is untouched. The people who can self-insure, who have sufficient income and assets, wouldn't need the compact. The middle class, people who want to live independently, live in the community, have the ability to retain income, retain assets, pay their own way, that's who the compact is designed for. So, question is, what's the next step for the elder law section? Uh, thank you for allowing me and Gail to present to you today. And Naomi, if anybody has questions, now's the time.
Thank you, Lou. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody. Oh, it looks like everybody's unmuted. So um, I guess questions, maybe just chime in. Anybody? Hey, Lou, I have a question. It's Valerie. Can you hear me? Hey, Valerie. How are Hi. You? Good, good, good. So, you know, with um, the, the, the cry against, um, and we know there'll be some proposals on the MRT to get rid of spousal refusal and things like that because of the fear of millionaires on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. But the way it's structured, like, so if someone has like a million dollars or more, they will be essentially be going on Medicaid after they spend, what is it, maximum, like, what was like 400000 or so, the three, cost of the four three, four sixty two based upon a New York City average regional rate. Right. So, like, I, 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 I can't crunch the numbers about, you know, what, well, well, more people, though, who are, Let's say now you have two million. You just don't even think about going on Medicaid, or maybe you do. I don't. I don't counsel those people. But now, it seems to me it'll be more of a draw for the people who are more wealthy to say, "Look, you you, you insure yourself for at most the four hundred eighty thousand, and after that, Medicaid will take care of you for long term care." Yeah, two two so, issues, so won't and then draw like, more you know, people. And I'll let Gail jump in. One, one issue is what the actuarials showed is that by the time you got through 36 months, exactly. or, or that $462,000, only 7% of the people are left. I, so, I, I doubt that's still true. That may be, but I mean, depends on how people, you define that trigger. Clients, you know, with dementia, 10 years, 15 years. Those are the outliers. And, and they're there. And they were in the study. Yeah. We did, a, we did an entire study of, this, of the state to look at uh, length of stay. And you had people, those who came out the back end, 36 months was the cutoff. Anything after 36 months, the extra cost, in quotes, to Medicaid was more than outweighed by the first 36 months of avoidance. Okay. So that, that's one. And the other is that this would obviously have to be rescored. That's a 14 year old study. Mm -hmm. So it would have to be redone based on current actuarials and current life expectancies. And we would also have to get this through the legislature and the governor where back when we did this originally, we had a three year look back for Medicaid. And so that changed to a five year look back in 2006. And so they want to do a five-year look back. We don't know, but that that would be another issue that we'd have to face. The millionaire on Medicaid argument is one of the reasons we propose this, because it it's a much worse argument if people are divesting and going on Medicaid immediately, where they're saving the entire two million dollars and paying nothing on their own behalf. Four hundred sixty-two thousand is a pretty good size expenditure. Even though you're going to get a subsidy on the back end, you're still responsible for all of your other health care. Hi, it's Jeanette, it's Jeanette Gravy. Hey, Jeanette. Hi. My concern is the source of the services. I'm just going to turn this down. I'm not going here. In source of the services. Currently, one of the big issues with getting services is that Medicaid or the MLTC is essentially paying $26, $28 an hour to the, to the home care agency, and the aides, of course, getting $15 or $14 an hour. When a client is spending down that first, the, their contribution, they're not going to be happy with the cost of service, with what they're paying for the service they're getting. And I see this pe with people who use long-term care insurance as well, when it says they have to use a licensed agency, and then they find out that, you know, they can get better services when they pay an A $20 an hour instead of paying the agency 26 and getting a $15 an hour aid. Is there going to be any requirement that they have to use licensed agencies? Because this also applies in CDPAP when they choose their own person. Yeah. Agencies getting the higher amount, the caretakers getting the lower amount. And CDPAP, it really doesn't make sense. But 
great, great issue. Absolutely. Uh, the workforce issue is one that the state has to grapple with in Medicaid and, and in private pay because there just isn't enough money in the system to keep many of the agencies going and, and pay a scale that's appropriate. Uh, and CDPAP allows us to go to individuals and get people in. Uh, and the, the ability to have some type of certification, not having to go through Elixa or CHA, but having individuals be able to be certified as providers with a minimal background education, background checks, et cetera. I, I think that's gonna have to happen with or without the compact. I think the compact would be a great forum to test that and to see if we can bring a workforce in other than through licensed agencies. But Gail, I know the insurance companies grapple with that. Oh, yes. And, and it, it, the the issue here is that we still have the fear, you know, you know, Valerie, when you brought up the, you know, the, the millionaires, um, they have the fear of what people are going to do with the money. And under this, there's so many options that could be applied. It could be actually with a, rather than going on a length of service kind of situation, you know, a fee for service, that you would be able to do other things. You might even be able to certify a family member. Which is the consumer directed program. And the, what we see right now in all of the propaganda about CDPAP is that children are signing up for CDPAP, getting paid an eight hour shift while they're working at their normal day job. Um, so when, when Bob Hers did this with us, we spent a year on the phone every week, a number of people who are on this call. And he said, show me every way that people can game the system. Right. And we need to legislate in this bill ways that we can prevent that. So if we can get a solid system of monitoring, and the technology today is vastly advanced from what it was 15 years ago. If we can get a solid system of monitoring the care in the home, I think it would open up the door to allowing, Jeanette, people to hire aides other than agency aides and private pay them at a scale much less than a full agency rate. Right, right. Okay, that would be great if this could get worked in. Because the plan in general, is, I think, is excellent, but that's an important part. Yeah, we're all facing that issue. Upstate, it's 10 times worse trying to find aides in the rural areas. We go up to the Canadian border in our practice. There's nobody. There's just nobody out there. Agencies cannot staff a case. Thanks. Lou, this is Naomi. Are, are you at all concerned about a sort of chilling effect that this kind of plan might have on just general robustness of the Medicaid program for people who are eligible and need it? Oh, interesting you asked that question. That's one of the reasons that it never made its way out of the assembly, um, because that was Assemblyman Gottfried's fear. Uh, he felt like the compact was a risk to traditional Medicaid. But this is a voluntary program. People have to opt in. Mm -hmm. So the goal here is to pull middle class people out of the Medicaid program and to leave it for those people who are truly needy. Right. When you have the entire middle class having only one program and you have impoverishment as the prerequisite to that program, everyone impoverishes itself and uses that Medicaid program. The compact is designed to pull those people in the middle class out, allow them to ensure the risk, give them a program that they can fulfill their own obligation and leave Medicaid for the truly needy. So that's the theory behind it. Not everyone believes that theory. Okay. Hi, good morning, John. Uh, would a hybrid life insurance long-term policy uh, qualify under the compact? Absolutely. The compact is agnostic as to the type of policy. And we've been talking to some insurance companies and they're getting creative. They're having to go back to the drawing board and rewrite all of their long-term care coverages so it could be a life hybrid, it could be a, a guaranteed universal life with a long-term care rider. As long as you have the money to meet your pledge, it doesn't matter where it comes from. 
It could be your money or any insurance policy that you come up with that meets the pledge and, and you're okay. And we think that the partnership, and Gail, maybe you could talk to this from the partnership side. Partnership was the best consumer driven long-term care policy ever invented, but that drove the cost through the roof, ultimately. Right. That's because the aim of the partnership, before we got a little smarter, was to protect people against the cost of long-term care, regardless of what their circumstances were. And the entire cost effectiveness was based on time, as we were talking earlier about the 36 months. If I can get you through 36 months, then I, Medicaid would have saved enough money. Unfortunately, the cost of the care going for against the cost of the care when that was rising meant that the cost of the insurance rose and it cut out more and more and more of the middle class this one stands back and said no we're not going to go against the cost of potential long-term care we're going to get going to go against the cost of what you can afford and not be poverty stricken it's a it's a very different concept but it's it is a natural flow out of the partnership. Did that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Right. I'd like to personally thank Gail for taking her personal time and, and helping me out with today's presentation. Thank you, Gail. The elder law section is lucky to have you still working with us. Uh, your, your knowledge of Medicaid and insurance is unique and valued. You're welcome. All right, yes, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Lou, very, very much for um, your time, all the effort you put into this. It was um, very, very helpful to me, I think, to a lot of people. Um, this will, I guess we will wrap up the, the call, the presentation. Um, if anybody has questions or needs information or uh, contact information, please reach out to me, uh, Naomi Levin. Lou, I don't know if you want to, your contact information was there. I don't know if you want to make yourself available as well, but I'm happy to route anybody um, who has follow-up questions. Um, sure. Thank you. If, if, if you have people that want more documentation on the compact, the last substantive piece that was written by Bob Hers was done in 2009, and it covers the legislation as it had written up to that point with all of his commentary. That is the most substantive piece that I have on the compact and the most current. So I'd be happy to hear that. Maybe you want to make it available, Naomi, to the committee. Absolutely. Yeah, we will post anything that you want to provide up to the Medicaid community, um, and we'll circulate it um, to the elder law section more generally. Great. So thank you again, everybody. Um, have a good rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.